This is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 12. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity and the privilege and everything you provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by looking at the translation we studied through last time, going back to verse 1 of chapter 13. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. From the fruit of his mouth a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to terror. The appetite of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the life of the diligent is fattened. A righteous man hates anything false, but the wicked becomes a stench and causes himself to be ashamed. Righteousness guards the blameless way, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. There is one who pretends to be rich, yet has nothing, and there is one who pretends to be poor and has great riches. The ransom of a person's life is his wealth, but the poor person hears no threat. The light of the righteous shines brightly, but the lamp of the wicked is put out. There is strife only with pride, but with those who take counsel there is wisdom. Wealth gained from vanity will dwindle, but, the, but he who gathers by hand increases. Well, did you remember a lot of those principles? Well, we've got more for you. Chapter 12 through verse 19 talks about satisfaction with wisdom versus frustration through foolishness. Verse 12 talks about hope. How does that fit into this? Hope deferred causes the heart to become sick but like a tree of life is a desire fulfilled. Hope is an expectation, something you expect that will give you a change for the better. Here it's said to be deferred. Now deferred means to delay. Here it means to delay continuously. In other words, it never happens. It's always put off. You think there's hope, you don't. It doesn't happen. You think again you'll hope that it'll come true, but it won't happen. It's like some, somebody's ball team who never wins. Hope deferred causes the heart to become sick. You've probably had a hope and disappointed in your life. It didn't happen. It can lead to some depression. Here, this is serious, much more serious. It can lead to grief, a loss of morale, despair, and even death. People give up hope. You ever heard that? Because there's no hope. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. That's the way it is for the wicked fool. He thinks things are going to get better for him, but things do not. Sometimes they get a lot worse. They build up for years. Maybe it's their savings. And they finally get to where they can enjoy their savings and they find out it's not worth like anything like it used to be. They don't have enough to live on. So now they're depressed, you see. In contrast, but I like but like a tree of life is a desire fulfilled. The righteous wise have those godly desires fulfilled. 
that is like a tree of life. A tree of life, again, it's the idea that God gives us the satisfied life. He gives us eternal life. He gives us an abundant life. And this eternal life takes us right into eternity. So, to have your desires fulfilled, godly desires as a righteous, wise person, gives you an abundant life. You have real things that's going to happen in your life. You have a genuine hope that will happen. As a Christian, hope means confidence. It's just not a possible expectation. It is a complete confidence that it will happen. We see that a lot in the New Testament. Our hope is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, trusting in Him brings us eternal life. That's just not a hope, but that's knowing something's going to happen. It's more like looking, it's more like looking at something in the future that you know is going to happen. And that brings satisfaction to your present life. So no matter how many difficult things you're going through right now, you can be confident that Christ will support you. He'll strengthen you. He'll provide for you. And he will do that all the way into eternity. Even if you were to die, you have eternal life and you're with the Lord. And you'll get a resurrection body someday. So the point is, right now, as the righteous wise, we have satisfaction in life. Our godly desires are fulfilled because we've lined up our desires with his word, with his will. And that carries us right on into eternity. Verse 13 brings in the importance of what we rely on. What are you going to rely on to get that tree of life? Look at verse 13. Whoever despises the word will pay for it, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Here we have two opposites. Whoever despises the word, that means to scorn or hold in contempt, uh, to reject. The word here is wisdom, instruction, the teachings of God's word, the commandments. We see that in the next line. Let's talk about despising the word. Why do people despise God's word? Well, it comes from sinful pride. They don't think they need God, so they don't need his word. They don't need his direction. They're under the delusion, the false impression, that they can have a good life without God. The Bible teaches us that if we trust in the Word of God, we are trusting in God. That's how important the Word of God is to us. That's how God communicates to us today, through His Word. Proverbs 16.20 talks about trusting in the Word and trusting in God. So what happens to the person who despises the Word it says he'll pay for it. That means, well, he'll be in debt to it. Now, this is another metaphor. It extends into the future so that when one dies, he'll owe a debt. For those who despise the word, they have a debt to be paid and it'll be at the judgment. Justice will come to the wicked when his debt comes due. What about the contrast? Well, here's the good part. But he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. The word fears here, remember fears sometimes means reveres. You have it in awe, highly respected. Here the idea of fearing a commandment is obeying it. You know it's what you got to do. Or you'll be in trouble, right? But at the same time, it's a good thing to do. It's what's best for you. Here it says, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. This reward is for those who have kept the word, who have lived by that moral order 
under the old covenant, they followed the law. They live by wisdom. They understand the word of God is just that. It is God's word. It's the inspired word, words to live by. <clears throat> Verse 14 brings us some of the near and far penalties of accepting or rejecting the word. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. This is one of those proverbs where one just builds upon the previous one. Let's talk about the fountain of life. Talked about the tree of life a while ago. You eat of the tree of life, you drink from the fountain of life. That makes sense. The fountain of life gives life. So when you hear someone teaching the word, teaching wisdom, it gives you life in the sense that you have a better life, a good life, a satisfied life. As a young person, we often dream about what we want to be or what will make us happy. Let me tell you something. As you get older, some of those dreams are going to change. Some of the things you think will make you happy are going to change. And as you learn the Word of God, you're going to find out that those things that you thought about as a young person probably weren't very realistic. It was fun at the time, but you never be, you may never be the great athlete you dream to be or someone who has everything they want. No, as a Christian, we follow Christ, and He gives us what's best. And let me tell you, that's a lot better than having everything you want as a young person. Because now we're into reality. Now we're into adult life where we have to take responsibility for our decisions. We don't always have a mom or dad to ask questions to. We have to make, them, make those decisions on our own. And if we make a mistake, we may pay for it. But we also get the benefits. That's why it's so important. Now listen to this. To keep... In mind that God is your heavenly Father. He's the one we look to all our life. So you start young, so it carries you right into adulthood, you see. The teaching of the Word and wisdom is a life giving process. Notice, to turn one away from the snares of death, it helps us avoid those traps that are set across the world to pull us in, get us away from God. Here it's described as death. Wisdom gives us discernment, so we'll avoid those snares, those traps. It alerts us when we're approaching a trap. A trap that would try to keep us away from God, to pull us away from God. And there are many, many traps. There are many traps. You've heard me talk about the cosmos diabolicus. There are so many things in this world that are set up to destroy the Christian. They're used by wicked men and women and wicked organizations. Uh, churches that claim to be churches that are not, where there's false teaching. They grab hold of a fool. They trap them, pull them away from God. So that rather than getting that teaching that is a fountain of life, you're pulled into that death trap. The word of God, the teaching of the wise, is a fountain of life. It'll keep you on the right path and away from those traps, those obstacles. Verse 15 gives us some more results of drinking from the fountain of life, or not. Good judgment wins favor, but the way of the treacherous leads to their destruction. Good judgment here is, well, just good sense. What you might call good Bible sense. You know the word, you know what's right, you know what's wrong. You understand things. If you continue to grow on the word, you'll understand things a lot better than many people, many adults. And when you do, 
you're drawing from that fountain of life. And here it says you win favor. Now favor means, you know this, it means to please somebody. Uh, maybe it's attractive, it's desirable. Here the favor is to both God and community. Good judgment wins favor from both God and community. Now, there are many people in the Bible who, has, who have won the favor of people in the community, and God especially. Think of the life of Joseph. See about him in Genesis 39 through 41, his life, and how he pleased God and men were happy with him too. He did such good things, um, successful things, that people looked to him. Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.26. You might want to look some of these up. Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.26. David, 1 Samuel 18, 14 through 16. Have you studied the life of Daniel, how he pleased God and pleased men too? Because he was so wise. Daniel 1.9, 1, 1.19 and 20. And of course, our Lord Jesus was showing favor in the eyes of God and man. Luke 2.52. This is who you want to be. You want to show favor in God's eyes because you've lived the obedient life. And he looks down and says, you're doing a good job. And other people see how you do the right things. You make good decisions. And they may want you to help them make good decisions. An opportunity to give them the gospel, you see. Those who are wise will see you as a wise person making good decisions. And they'll say good things about you. Or they'll look to you and say, you know, your mom and dad did a, good, did a real good job raising you. And you'll realize one of these days, well, you know, they sure did do a good job. You see, you see all these other people around you whose parents weren't home or working or, or went off somewhere and didn't take care of them or raise them right or teach them the word and their lives are a mess. Listen to a New Testament principle, Romans 14, 18. For he who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Well, let's look at the contrast. Verse 15. The contrast, but the way of the treacherous leads to destruction. The treacherous person is one who's faithless, who's a betrayer, a deceiver. He's disloyal. Treachery leads to their destruction. So it's like they're going down a road, a path, and then they find out it's a dead end. Literally. They don't have favor with God or man. Those who do not stay loyal to God, who are faithless, who deceive their path is destruction. Now you've heard me teach you a lot of simple principles. It basically comes down sometime to either do the right thing or the wrong thing. You do the right thing, you're blessed by God. You dress, you're blessed sometimes by people. You're, you win their favor. You do the wrong thing, life will crush you. You will not win God's favor. It will get you in real trouble with God. As Christians, we have no excuse. We have his Holy Spirit. We have his word. So we should be able to stay on the path all the time. The only time we get off the path is when we make bad decisions. We make bad decisions because we don't have good judgment. And the reason we don't have good judgment is because we haven't learned the word. And you make good judgments when you know the word, you know God's goals for your life, what's important, what's not important. You make bad decisions when you refuse to obey his word or learn his word. In verse 16, we see a contrast between a shrewd person and a fool. A shrewd person and a fool. Every shrewd man act with knowledge, 
but a fool flaunts his folly. Here we kind of have another general con contrast between a shrewd man and a fool, but let's talk about a shrewd man. A shrewd person is the one who anticipates the outcome of his decisions. In other words, you can sit there and you can think about, well, if I say this, they're going to say that. Or if I do this, this is going to happen. Or if I don't do this, this is going to happen. You see? A shrewd person outsmarts his opponents. He's one step ahead of them. So he's in a way clever, but it's in a good way. Because he's got this shrewdness from wisdom. He knows what the bad person's going to do. So he doesn't fall into their trap, you see. The word here for accents can sometimes mean cover, depending exactly what this word means here, to cover. So you're covering what you say. You don't always tell everybody everything you're going to do. You don't want to tell the bad guy your plans because he'll go set it up so he can trap you, you see. Let's say he's going to set an ambush for you. You don't tell him which way you're going to go home. You're shrewd. Maybe you'll come up behind him with the police. You see? You're shrewd. You're clever. It may also mean to take cover or refuge. You know something's going to happen beforehand, so you take cover. You're aware of the danger. On the other hand, a fool. Now listen to this. A fool flaunts. You know what flaunts means? It means just to lay out your plans before everybody. You tell everybody everything. The actually ancient word means to spread out like a garment, like you might spread it out and, and uh, steam it to get the wrinkles out or spread it out to clean it or a fishing net to spread it out and then repair it, let it dry out. A fool shows what he's thinking. He flaunts it. This is what I'm going to do. And he talks like no one's going to be able to stop him. And his flaunting continues because he doesn't think the consequences are going to cost him anything. Or that someone might outwit him, you know, that shrewd person. The shrewd and the fool act in opposite ways. Shrewdness does not mean to be dishonest. It means to do what you do with wisdom. Verse 17 addresses another contrast between our two types. Remember our two types are the righteous wise versus the wicked fool. Verse 17 a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Now, a little background is helpful here. In the ancient world, they didn't have communication like we have today. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have quite the mail service that we have or, or emails and, and messenger and all those other ways that we communicate. They actually had to give a letter to someone. He'd have to walk it there. It was transporting a message by some kind of courier. Now, a wicked messenger falls into trouble. So you have an important message to deliver somebody, and you give it to someone, and you didn't know at the time, but he's wicked. Think the message will get there? Maybe he'll stop off and, and uh, sleep or play a game or do something he shouldn't be doing, and your messenger... Uh, doesn't get to where he's supposed to get going with your message. Or maybe he gets there so late it doesn't help anything. Wicked people are unreliable as messengers. They fall under trouble. On the other hand, but a faithful envoy. Let's talk about an envoy. You've probably heard the term before. It's often a person or team of persons sent to represent somebody like the President of the United States might send an envoy to some foreign country and they have a message, they have a policy, they want to have them sign. You want them to be faithful. This is important. An envoy had to do often with government service. 
In fact, he was very important in the ancient world, an envoy had other skills too. He was trained in writing. He might write the message. Different languages. The country he's going to may have a foreign language. He may have, he may have to learn that language. So he would be a diplomat or a soldier or even a special agent, a royal agent from the king, you see. The faithful, the loyal uh, envoy. He brings healing. In what ways would he bring healing? Well, maybe he's bringing a peace treaty between two warring nations. Or some sort of ceasefire between two armies. Perhaps it's just a message from a father to a daughter whose daughter misunderstood her father and ran off. Or something along that line, but he's the one that you can trust to bring the message you want, and it can bring healing. He may deliver a truce. So it was important that he be trusted as a righteous, wise person, well, let's be practical. Make sure if you have an important message, it goes to another righteous, wise person, a faithful messenger or a faithful envoy. At the same time, if you're given that mission, you certainly want to be faithful. It can mean the difference between war and peace. If you were an envoy, you see, or a member of an envoy, so the success of his mission depended on his trustworthiness. Now that's something to learn wisdom about. Can you trust this person with your money, with your life, with your message, you see? In verse 18, we see reward for our two types of people, the righteous wise or the wicked fool. Verse 18, Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction. Now, which one would this be? Sure, it's the wicked fool. The words poverty and disgrace here is basically saying the same thing. It means shameful poverty. Shameful poverty. He's a disgrace. His poverty is a disgrace. That means he's poor. Now, remember, there are two types of poor. There are those who are poor by choice. We've talked about them. The lazy, the sluggard, the slothful, those who'd rather sleep in than work. Those are poor by choice. But there are some who are poor not by choice. In fact, the Bible talks about them having integrity. Proverbs 17.1 and 19.1. In a few moments, we'll talk about the poor who are that way because of injustice, 13.23. So, we're going to talk about the shameful poor, those who make bad choices, are lazy, sluggard, slothful. And there's le what I will call the legitimate poor. Legitimate. It's okay to be poor. You see? Sometimes people become poor out of their control. Uh, maybe there's a flood and it takes everything they have and they have nothing. We've seen that a lot around in this area of Texas. Just wipes out everything. In some parts of the country, they have fires that burn everything, burn their houses and their property and even kills their animals. Those people aren't poor by choice, but there are many who decide they don't want to work. They just want to depend on the government or depend on people and beg for money. Those are the kind of poor who are disgraceful. What do they do? Well, first of all, they get there because they ignored instruction. They never cared about God or the word or truth or wisdom. But look at the second half, the contrast. But whoever heeds reproof is honor. To heed means to hear and obey. You listen to it, you make the correction. Notice, whoever heeds reproof, correction, strong correction is honored. In other words, 
you were going down the wrong path and someone says, wrong path, and you go, oh, no. So you straighten out and go down the right path, you see. You're honored by God, by society, because you've made good decisions for your life as you get older, for your family. So here's the principle. If you want reward in life, you need to be willing to take correction. And even society will honor you. I have three young sons in college right now in university. And they have professors that are sometimes very liberal, what we call liberal. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in wisdom or the word. But they're, they're teaching a subject that my son needs to learn. Perhaps it's a science or it's history. And, and they learn that subject. And sometimes they get into personal conversations with these professors. And they find out that they don't believe in God. And they think a lot of a, the children's values are, are silly. Or waste of waste of time have no real value in life. That's because they have different values that are not of God. So what happens is, is my sons will do real well in their class. They'll learn their history. They'll learn that literature, whatever the class is. And they'll make an A. They often make A's. And they're approved by man because this son has learned how to discipline himself and dedicate himself to a study. Now, we as parents, the main thing we did is just try to teach him some discipline. We taught him some school, but we didn't grind it out with him every day. No, a lot of it was learning on their own. And they come to learn that it's important to learn something if you're going to get anywhere in the way the world order is. If you're gonna work hard, you have to have training and the better jobs to get enough money to make a living. Now that's just being uh, using common sense. So they get a reward in life by learning how to do the right things. They take correction many times. And even society will honor them. So they get into the honor society. They get on the dean's list. And I think the wife and I are sitting back kind of amazed because they struggled at home with some of their studies. Some of them didn't like it. Some of them uh, rather do anything other than study. But they had their time they had to study before they could play. It wasn't that much, actually, a few hours a day. But they also didn't have all the junk that so many public schools are teaching. So they had a lot of truth, a good history, a good solid basis on values and goals and what's important. So they get out there and they work real well in God's order. And they're rewarded. This is the way God has set things up. Verse 19, we have to do with the righteous and desires, again, with the righteous desires are fulfilled. Verse 19. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the person, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. This was kind of tricky to follow. It's stayed a little awkward, but I'll explain through it. Here we have another one of those inexact opposites. Not everything is exactly opposite. One line has to do with what's in your mind, the mental. The other one has to do with what we call ethical or moral principles. And we can fill in. So let's talk about a desire. Now, this would be the righteous, wise person's desire. So it would be a godly desire, a legitimate desire, a good desire. When it's fulfilled, it's sweet. It's wonderful to the person. That's the word nephish. We've seen that so many times in the Hebrew. It's the word nephish. It has to do with life and person. It means other things too, but here it means person. So it's fulfilling. It's nice. It's wonderful. But look at this next line. But it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. So what this is saying is, in a fool's opinion, for him to get away from evil, 
Now listen carefully. For him to get away from evil, he considers that an abomination. To him, it's the worst thing in the world not to be evil. And you're probably sitting there thinking, that's crazy. Exactly. But it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Isn't that just the opposite? Of course. In other words, a fool loves his evil. He doesn't want to leave it. That's the way he satisfies his sin. That is where they thrive in their godlessness and immorality. They rarely experience fulfilling good, legitimate desires. They can never eat from that tree of life or drink from that fountain of life or have that good, satisfied life where the desires are met. And since he rejects the ways of God, he gains nothing good and lasting. Only the righteous wise experience the sweet satisfaction of a good, wholesome life. The wicked fool keeps going back to the same old stuff, the same old sin, the same old lifestyle. He will never experience the kind of life that God has for those who are his. Verse 20 through 25, our closing section, has to do with the future, the blessed future of the wise and the miserable end of the fool. Verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, but whoever associates with fools will suffer harm. This one's really kind of easy to understand. To walk with someone is to be their companion, to be in fellowship with them. Uh, to walk along, that's the picture here. You learn from them, you watch them, you listen to them. Uh, that's what happens as you walk with them and you become wiser. So when you walk along with your wise parents, talk to them, ask them questions, listen to what they say. They'll give you wisdom. In contrast, whoever associates with fools will suffer harm. One who associates with fools are, are going to adopt their way. If you hang around with fools, you're going to Listen to them. So what do you learn from fools? Well, you got two choices. Nothing or more foolishness. Which is really nothing worth knowing. So the big question is, who are you going to walk with? And if you walk with fools, notice what happens. Will suffer harm. The world system, the world order as we put it in the sense of God's world order, his rules, his wisdom. He will suffer harm. He will bring harm, harm on himself. All right. Let me make a distinction here because I don't want you to be confused. I got this new drawing board. Let's see how it works. You've heard me talk about, let's see if I can get a good circle in here. The cosmos diabolicus, right? The cosmos diabolicus. That is all the evil systems that Satan has in place in this world that are corrupt, that are against God, against Christians, against his word. It's in everything there is. It's in education. It's in business. It's in entertainment. It's in law and order. It's in law enforcement. Let's just put law enforcement. It's in government. Okay. It's in the social clubs, whatever clubs there are. It's on teams. And you see this if you ever get into professional athletes, just how corrupt things are. It's in every organization on earth, even false churches. I say false churches, those who don't teach the word or live by the word. 
That is what we call, on the one hand, the world. The world. Sometimes we call it the cosmos diabolicus. Diabolicus. Satan's world system. However, we still live in the world, don't we? Let's get another circle up there. We still live in the world. Let's just put it right there. God has an order. We'll just call it God's order. To learn God's order, it demands that you be moral. These moral principles are given to us from birth. We know what's right and wrong as we get older. You're not to steal. You're not to uh, lie. You're not to kill anyone. You're not to murder. Let's make sure we understand that. You might have to kill in self-defense one day or as a soldier or maybe as a police officer. We also learn that wisdom shows us how to live in God's order. So I talk about God's order. This is what I'm talking about. But sometimes I'll use the word, the word world. That could refer to either one, depending on which one we're talking about. All right? Mostly in Proverbs, we're talking about God's order. But we're having to deal with both all the time. If you're going to be successful in life, you follow God's rule. But at the same time, you know this one, this one right here, is kind of on top of this, trying to ruin it for you. And how do you get through all of that? Follow God's law, his commandments, be obedient. So understand there's two different kinds of world here, we might say. God's world order. Then the world of cosmos diabolicus, that God allows Satan to be our test all the time. So, this is why we have those wicked fools. This is what they love. This is what the wicked fool thrives in. All right, he loves the cosmos diabolical. He, he wants it. He loves being in, letting it be in control. And you say, well, that's pretty silly. Yes, it is. But see, he's a fool. That's one reason we call him a fool. The, the righteous, wise, constantly want to follow God's world order. So we can almost say this is Satan's world order, and this is God's. So here we go again. Verses, huh? And that's what we've been studying through much of the Proverbs, is the contrasting life between these two. Which are you going to accept? Which are you going to follow? Where's the fool lie? Right over here. The righteous wise, he's right here. Verse 21 talks about present and future reward for our two types. This is pretty simply also. Trouble pursues sinners, but good things reward the righteous. If you're going to thrive in the sinful world, the world of Satan, the cosmos diabolicus, Trouble is going to pursue you. It pursues the wicked fool. Pursue here means to chase, to hunt, to even capture and kill. That's the end result. The sinner is usually described as the person who violates God's law. His life is self-centered. He's out to satisfy his cravings and his lust to follow his sin, his sin nature to uh, live under its control all the time. That's all he can do, by the way. So trouble is pictured as hunting the sinner, and it's going to catch him every time. In contrast, notice, but good things reward the righteous. You live the righteous, wise life, your reward is going to be good things. God's going to bring good things to you and reward in heaven. 
So God has set it up. And let's go back to our two orders again. God has set this world up that if the society you live in, the country you live in, is moral and decent, follows God's moral laws, that is, things like uh, if you work hard, you make money, you live by it. If you don't work hard, well, you're going to be poor and shameful. If you don't work at all, you're really going to be shameful. Right? So that's God's order of things. Which world are you going to live in? You see? If you follow God's moral law, his moral order will reward you. Minimum trouble. Often the troubles you get are tests in life. We know a lot about that already. But not only that, but you thrive and you live and you enjoy God's order of things. You learn to love doing things right no matter what the cost. Because you know that pleases God. Let's talk about some of the end results of doing the right thing. Verse 22. A good man leaves inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous person. Now this is kind of interesting too. A good man here again is our righteous wise. He passes on good things to his children and his grandchildren. All right, we'll talk about what those things are in a moment. But in contrast, the wealth of a sinner, whatever the sinner gains in this life, it might be material wealth, it might be respect, it might be something, but after a while, towards the end of his life sometimes, or after his life is gone and he's dead, all that he had accumulated passes on to someone else. And it's often the righteous. Who are the righteous? Those who stayed within the world order. Let's go back to our two contrasting worlds. So the person over here, let's get the word, let's get some blue here. He builds up riches. He may be a crook. He's corrupt. He takes advantage of the poor, the legitimate poor. And he builds up all these riches so that he thinks as he gets older and then he dies, he's just, he's got to be good. He's, since he's made good money, he must be good to God. No, no. It ends up where what he made all his life passes on, not to his children, but ever, whatever's worth ha having falls right back into the world order where the righteous get it. You say, well, how does that happen? It can happen a number of ways. Let's say that he decides that he's going to make his money as a crook. And he accumulates millions of dollars. Well, when he gets caught or when he dies, that doesn't go to his children. His children are probably going to suffer too, just like him. But let's say it does go to his children. It might go to his children. However, his children, if they follow in the footsteps of their father, one of these days, God's moral order is going to catch up with them. In other words, we call it justice. That's part of God's moral order. And justice will take those riches and put them back where they belong. A little hard to follow. Or the tax man catches up with him. And the government finds out he's a cheat. And he has to pay off his taxes. And now he loses in a big way. Or this... Sinner, what we've talked about, the righteous wicked, may be a leader of a country or an army. He loses his battle, loses his country, and everything goes over to the winner who is just. But eventually, it goes back to God's system in a good way. And that's where the just get their reward. Well, it's one of the things I've learned in life. If you get into a corrupt business, which most are, in my opinion, uh, and they reward the dishonest or those who don't work that hard or those who are not moral, eventually it'll come back to you. One way or the other, you'll realize that 
If you're pleasing God, that's the main thing in life. And the thing that they're really enjoying is going to fly away one day. They're going to lose it all. And they never have that satisfied life. Can you think of any examples in Scripture where God gave the wealth over to his people and took it away from those who are wrong? What about the Egyptians? Remember when the Jews exited through the Exodus, Egypt, they took so much wealth loaded up with all sorts of material goods to take it to the land. Or when they got to the land and Joshua and his armies took the land away from the Canaanites who were evil and it went to the just. Or in the future, the righteous will inherit the earth once dominated by the cosmos diabolicus. So ultimately, when final justice comes, the wealth of the sinner goes to the righteous person. Verse 23. The unplowed field of poor people yields plenty of food, but it's swept away through injustice. Now this is an interesting one. Another one we need some background. How did poor people eat in the ancient world? Well, the Mosaic Law, the Old Covenant, provided for them. Listen to Exodus 23, 10, and 11. For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. So what would happen is God set up this law in his moral order for the nation of Israel. This, this had to do with Israel in particular, these, these particular laws. And they would work their fields and get their crops, but on that seventh year, they were not supposed to work them. And the crops that grew went to the poor people. So the poor people, this is legitimate poor, had food to eat. But what would happen? What if they didn't stop working their fields on that seventh year? Or the field manager or the owner of the field didn't let the poor come and get that extra food. That's what the second line means. But it is swept away through injustice. They're not just with their people. And this food was rightfully the poor's. This is the way God took care of the poor people. He said, you're going to set aside food for them every seventh year. And they're going to collect it, and they're going to eat it, and you say, well, how can it last for seven years? Some food you can store for a long time, especially if it's something like grain, and it's stored well. You'll have grain for food, and they could do that. Or maybe they could sell it. And then they would have that food, uh, or money rather, for future times. But when there's injustice, the poor don't get their food. That's what this is talking about. It wasn't because there's anything wrong with the system or the environment, but because there was injustice that poor people didn't get what they were to eat, the legitimate poor. If they happened to starve, it wasn't because the law didn't provide, it was because of injustice, because sinners who selfishly took advantage of the poor. They withheld from the poor what was rightfully theirs. Did you hear that? Rightfully theirs. It was theirs. Now today, some people, no, they're leaving it for them. No, that's not. Listen, you can understand. God gave those farmers, those owners, everything they needed to grow crops. Sunshine, rain, land, the minerals for the plants, the plants to grow. That's one view they often ignore. But when you realize that, you understand it's all God's. And if there's justice, the poor will get fed. In verse 24, the one who holds back his rod is one who hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Well, you've probably heard this one many times. It's probably one of the more famous ones. Withhold the rod, spoil the child, that type of thing. That's the idea. A rod was a 
rod or a stick, some sort of staff, that was used to discipline a child. It was usually hit, hit him on the backside, physically hit him. Um, this is the parents, the father and mother, using discipline to train the child. We call it corporal discipline. Corporal, C-O-R-P-O-R-E-A-L. It physically caused pain on the child by striking him on the backside. And notice also, it's his rod. It's the parent's rod. They have something to discipline the child with. One of the things I always kept around for the children when they were younger was a paddle. And the boys got paddled up to a certain age, and so did the girls. If you, as a parent, and children, you listen to this, if the parent does not discipline the child, it shows that they hate the child. You say, wow, that's pretty strong. Well, what does that mean? If you don't discipline a child as a parent, if the parent doesn't discipline you, they're showing their lack of care, their not lack of neglect, because what they're doing, if they don't discipline you, they let you get a, a they let you get away with wrong behavior, bad behavior. And when you're really young, sometimes you don't learn what's right except by the rod. Look at the contrast. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. If you love your child, you're going to be diligent. What does diligent mean? Fair, measured, timely, consistent. All of that's part of proper discipline. The parent's not to supposed to discipline out of anger or from a whim or maybe not getting the whole story. God himself is our model for this. Listen to Proverbs 3.12. Because whom the Father, excuse me, because whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. So our Lord disciplines us because he loves us. If we sin, we get disciplined. Why? He wants us to do the right thing. He knows if we do the right thing, that's best for us. That's where we get his blessing. We see that in the New Testament as well. Listen to Revelation 3.19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So this is addressed to those who might be sinning. If they're sinning, they need to repent. Otherwise, God is going to discipline them. Don't forget that when your parents discipline you, they're showing their love. Now, you're probably not going to feel like it very much, but you know you messed up, and you know it was really wrong. Now, that doesn't mean they always have to use a stick. Of course not. They need to straighten out your behavior. The best way to straighten out your behavior maybe is to stop you from playing a game. If you're into video games, maybe it's to restrict the usage. As very young children, sometimes they need a good spanking. The child learns what good behavior is, and you want to learn that early in life so you don't make those mistakes as you get older as a teenager, so you're not the rebellious teenager or the criminal adult. So, for parents, if they love their children, you will discipline your children. And children, you accept that discipline. You did wrong. Let me tell you something. You know that we all have sin natures. And when you're really young, you don't quite understand what's right and wrong sometimes. Maybe you think that a little lie is okay, or a little cheating, or a little not telling your parents something you did is okay, and you get caught. You should find out that it's not okay. That you're on a path to trouble if you keep it up. And then parents should always discipline their children as someone they truly love and value. They're not out to damage. They're not out to be too harsh. But they show their love 
through good discipline. And that makes the child, it makes you as a child better. We close by looking at returning to our main theme. Remember this, eating and appetite and satisfaction. A righteous person has enough food to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked lacks bread. This is pretty simple too, except a lot of it's metaphorical, it's figurative. To satisfy your appetite goes back to taking from that tree of life or drinking from that fountain of life and having the satisfied life. Not only do you have what you need to eat physically, but it extends into what you need spiritually for your mind, for your body. But the belly of the wicked, that's the wicked fool, well, it's not going to have the satisfied life. It's not going to have the bread. So he's going to suffer spiritually, mentally, physically, just the opposite of the righteous. This all goes back to basically the Mosaic Law. If you do the right thing, you're blessed. If you do the wrong thing, you are cursed. Well, we went through some of those kind of fast, but you can always go back and read over them again or stop the video and, and uh, carefully listen to it again. They're very important principles to live by. Hopefully, you can just read your scripture now and understand them. Well, let's close by reading through what we studied today, beginning in verse 12. Hope deferred causes the heart to become sick. But like a tree of life is a desire fulfilled. Whoever despises the word will pay for it, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Good judgment wins favor, but the way of the treacherous leads to their destruction. Every shrewd man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and disgrace comes to him who ignores instruction. But whoever, but whoever heeds the reproof is honored. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the person, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Walk with the wise and become wise, but whoever associates with fools will suffer harm. Trouble pursues sinners, but good things reward the righteous. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous person. The unplowed field of poor people yields plenty of food, but it is swept away through injustice. The one who holds back his rod is one who hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. A righteous person has enough food to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked lacks bread. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this wisdom. Lord, we've learned so many things about how to live and how to get the most out of this life, to have the satisfied life, to enjoy life, and then have it carry right on into eternity. So we ask that in the power of your Spirit, you will challenge us with these things, that we might apply them and be wise in our decisions and make good judgments. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.